On the white beach, ground-up coral and broken bones, a group of the children are walking. They must have been swimming. They're still wet and glistening. They should be more careful. Who knows what may infest the lagoon? But they're unwary, unlike snowmen, who won't dip a toe in there even at night when the sun can't get at him. Revision, especially at night. He watches them with envy, or is it nostalgia? It can't be that. He never swam in the sea as a child. The children scan the terrain, stoop, pick up flotsam. Then they deliberate among themselves, keeping some items, discarding others. Their treasures go into a torn sack. Sooner or later, he can count on it. They'll seek him out where he sits, wrapped in his decaying sheet, hugging his shins and sucking on his mango, in under the shade of the trees because of the punishing sun. For the children, thick-skinned, resistant to ultraviolet, he's a creature of dimness, of the dusk. Here they come now. Snowman, oh snowman, they chant in their sing-song way. They never stand too close to him. Is that from respect, as he'd like to think, or because he stinks? He does stink. He knows that well enough. He's rank. He's gamey. He reeks like a walrus. Oily, salty, fishy. Not that he's ever smelled such a beast, but he's seen pictures. Opening up their sack, the children chorus, Oh, snowman, what have we found? They lift out the objects, hold them up as if offering them for sale. A hubcap, a piano key, a chunk of pale green pop bottle smoothed by the ocean. A plastic Bliss Plus container, empty. A Chicky Knob's bucket of nubbins, ditto. A computer mouse, or the busted remains of one, with a long, wiry tail. Snowman feels like weeping. What can he tell them? There's no way of explaining to them what these curious items are, or were, but surely they've guessed what he'll say, because it's always the same. These are things from before. He keeps his voice kindly, but remote. A cross between pedagogue, soothsayer, and benevolent uncle. That should be his tone. Will they hurt us? Sometimes they find tins of motor oil, caustic solvents, plastic bottles of bleach, booby traps from the past. He's considered to be an expert on potential accidents, scalding liquids, sickening fumes, poison dust, pain of odd kinds. These? No, he says. These are safe. At this they lose interest, let the sack dangle. But they don't go away, they stand, they stare. Their beachcombing is an excuse. Mostly they want to look at him, because he's so unlike them. Every so often they ask him to take off his sunglasses and put them on again. They want to see whether he has two eyes, really, or three. He awakes to thunder and a sudden wind. The afternoon storm is upon him. He scrambles to his feet, grabs his sheet. Those howlers can come on very fast, and a metal bed frame in a thunderstorm is no place to be. He's built himself an island of car tires back in the woods. It's simply a matter of crouching on them, keeping their insulation between himself and the ground until the storm is over. Sometimes there are hailstones as big as golf balls, but the forest canopy slows their fall. He reaches the pile of tires just as the storm breaks. Today it's only rain, the usual deluge, so heavy the impact turns the air to mist. Water sluices down onto him as the lightning sizzles. Branches thrash around overhead, rivulets amble along the ground. Already it's cooling down. The scent of freshly washed leaves and wet earth fills the air. Once the rain is slowed to a drizzle and the rumbles of thunder have receded, he slogs back to his cement slab cache to collect the empty beer bottles. Then he makes his way to a jagged concrete overhang that was once part of a bridge. Beneath it, there's a triangular orange sign with the black silhouette of a man shoveling. Men at work, that used to mean. Strange to think of the endless labor, the digging, the hammering, the carving, the lifting, the drilling, day by day, year by year, century by century. And now the endless crumbling that must be going on everywhere. Sand castles in the wind. Runoff is pouring through a hole in the side of the concrete. He stands under it with his mouth open, gulping water full of grit and twigs and other things he doesn't want to think about, 
The water must have found a channel through derelict houses and pungent cellars and clotted up ditches and who knows what else. Then he rinses himself off, wrings out his sheet. He doesn't get himself very clean this way, but at least he can shed the surface layer of grime and scum. It would be useful to have a bar of soap. He keeps forgetting to pick one up during his pilfering excursions. Lastly, he fills up the beer bottles. He should get himself a better vessel, a thermos or a pail, something that would hold more. Also, the bottles are awkward, they're slippery and hard to position. He keeps imagining he can still smell beer inside them, though it's only wishful thinking. Let's pretend this is beer. He shouldn't have brought that up. He shouldn't torture himself. He shouldn't dangle impossibilities in front of himself, as if he were some caged, wired-up lab animal, trapped into performing futile and perverse experiments on his own brain. Get me out, he hears himself thinking. But he isn't locked up. He's not in prison. What could be more out than where he is? I didn't do it on purpose, he says in the sniveling child's voice he reverts to in this mood. Things happened. I had no idea. It was out of my control. What could I have done? Just someone, anyone. Listen to me, please. What a bad performance. Even he isn't convinced by it. But now he's weeping again.